Hi, I'm Steve Hebrock. When you see a hoof care provider at work with a horse, are you really confident that you understand what you should and shouldn't be seeing that person doing? One of the things that many horse owners in this country are unaware of is that there is absolutely no legal requirement for calling yourself a hoof care provider, a trimmer, a farrier, a blacksmith, a horseshoer. None of those terms carry any legal requirement for education or experience. Consequently, when you see a person at work with a horse on their feet, you may be seeing someone who has a great deal of experience and a lot of education, or someone that really just watched a DVD or read a book or two and now calls themselves a hoof care provider. The well-known equine anatomist and author, Dr. Deb Bennett, speaks quite strongly on this subject. Here's what she has to say. As I see it, there are two great problems plaguing the profession of horseshoeing or farriery today. The first is that while it's many intelligent, hardworking, and often passionately dedicated practitioners give it the potential to be a science, horseshoeing has not yet risen to that level. But instead, outside of a few veterinary clinics and university laboratories, has largely remained the craft that it was during the Middle Ages. The second problem, which is tied to the first, is that most horseshoers lack any training in orthopedics, a branch of medical science whose object is to foster and promote comfort in stance and movement. This is the one proper object of farriery. She goes on to describe how that lack of proper training and education really impacts the horseshoer's ability to properly do his or her job. Lack of training in orthopedics cripples the horseshoer's ability to accurately assess the individual horse and therefore to properly plan and execute a treatment or series of treatments. This is the root cause for the many justified complaints of horse owners. Even more seriously, she points out that improperly trained people really have no business at all working on yours or anyone else's horse. What concerns me, and it ought to be of concern to every horse owner, is that a person with little or no training and physical assessment, no knowledge of the development or physiology of body tissues, a vague or incorrect concept of what is normal in stance, who is unprepared to relate the principles of physics or biomechanics to his work, who has never been taught how to develop a long-term treatment plan, or even that this would be of importance. This person is going to be asked to design, manufacture, and apply an orthotic device to my horse's limb. When the farrier does not know why to proceed, he cannot know how to proceed. If good work happens, it happens by chance. This last statement is particularly strong. Dr. Bennett goes on to describe how this pseudoscience has really become commonplace in the horseshoeing world and places a lot of the blame for that on the American professor William Russell in a book entitled Scientific Horseshoeing published in 1903. We find that although there is a correct grasp of anatomy, there is no real concern with maintaining normal feet. There is a concern that masquerades as concern for the horse. Russell's beautifully engraved plates memorialize engineering ideals, not biological realities. They show perfectly symmetrical hooves being measured with gauges, proof positive of the superiority of the scientific approach advocated by the author. Unfortunately, this reliance on numbers and on patterns is no longer unique to horseshoers in the hoof business. Um, more and more with the advent of so-called barefoot or natural trimming, we see people advancing the idea that they can somehow trim properly using certain templates or certain patterns or numbers or hoof mapping. None of that is correct. You can't do a good job by using that kind of information.
nature doesn't follow any pattern like that when it lays out the design of a particular organism or that organism's parts. Those things tend to follow what's normally called a curve of normal distribution or a bell curve, which I'm sure you're familiar with. She finishes up with a strong caution to farriers, warning them to view each horse as the individual that is and trim them accordingly. Constant observation opens the eyes of farriers firmly grounded in the biology of the horse to individual variation and compels them to respond to individual needs rather than following a set, standard, or mechanical program of trimming and shoeing learned by rote and applied by the numbers irrespective of the needs of the individual horse. So whether your horse is shod or merely trimmed, your hoof care provider has no business using measurements, templates, patterns, any sort of number to do his or her job. They need to treat each and every horse as the individual that he or she is. Another problem facing the horse owner is that none of us really have a firm grasp of exactly what we know and don't know about a particular subject. That makes it very difficult for us to be in a position to determine whether someone else is competent in that area. Professors Dunning and Kruger at Cornell University's psychology department have done a lot of study in this particular subject area. One of their studies uh, consisted of taking a large number of individuals and asking each person to assess his or her own ability in three technical areas. And then they gave them an exam testing their ability in those three areas. And the results are quite surprising. Let's take a look. And as you'll see, the average person ranks their ability in these particular technical subject areas at around the 70% mark. However, when the professors actually tested these individuals on their actual knowledge, a very different picture emerges. As you can see from the graph, their actual test scores are much different from the person's perceived abilities in those particular subject areas. At the low end of the scale, there's as much as a seven times gap between what the people believe they know and what they actually know. The implications of the results of this study are pretty clear. For the purposes of this subject, it means that most horse owners don't know what they believe they know about hoof care, and it's highly likely that most hoof care providers don't know what they believe they know about hoof care either. So what I would ask you to do is approach this subject with a fresh outlook, an open mind, and consider what I'm saying and see if it doesn't make logical sense to you when all is said and done. So before we get started talking about some of the theory and practice of hoof care, we ought to make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to anatomy of the horse's foot. So let's just take a minute and look at some of the physical structures on the outside and uh, take it from there. I know you're all familiar with that hard outer covering over the bones and sensitive structures of the hoof uh, called the hoof wall. And this is the sole. And the separation between the two or the connection between the two is referred to as the white line. It's not really visible on Kim here because she needs a trim but the white line is actually more of a yellow color than a white color, and we'll talk more about the white line uh, in depth shortly. The, the hoof wall doesn't really start and end back here with the heel buttresses, or heels as they're commonly referred to, but rather starts and ends up here with the bars, and the bars start there and come around and go up like this. These bars kind of function like springs, if you will, so that when the horse's foot leaves the ground, it helps return the foot to its normal unloaded state. 
the frog, the larger structure you see here, apex of the frog, the central sulcus of the frog, this groove you see, and on either side of the frog, between the bars and the frog, are the collateral grooves. Finally, back here we've got the horse's heel bulbs. Sometimes people will refer to those as her heels, uh, but it can get confusing when we, we're not sure if we're talking about these structures or these structures. So just keep that in mind when somebody mentions heels. We're now going to take a look inside the foot and look at some of the structures in there. So here we go. We'll continue our look at the anatomy of the horse's lower limb by considering the inside of the right front forelimb, starting with the cannon bone. This long vertical bone forms the top half of the fetlock joint. And as I turn it around, you can see there are actually four other bones associated with this cannon bone. The cannon bone is also known as the third metacarpal bone. Up at the top of it, you'll notice the second and fourth metacarpal bones. These long, thin bones are the vestigial remains of digits the horse once had. Down at the bottom of the bone, you'll notice two of the three so-called sesamoid bones that can be found in the lower limb of the horse. The function of sesamoid bones is not really one of bearing weight, but rather one of directing or redirecting the motion of tendons. And you'll see how those work shortly. We'll spin back to the front and go ahead and add in the next bone forming the rest of the fetlock joint. This is known as the long pastern bone or P1 and the short pastern bone below it or P2. The last large bone in there is the coffin bone or P3 also known as the pedal bone. And if we turn the leg around so we can look at the back a little better. Please note the construction of the joints and how the bones come together. It's very interesting and very important when we talk about proper shoeing and trimming. We'll add in the last of the bones that can be found in the horse's lower limb. That fourth bone there, that little bone is called the navicular bone, found at the back of the coffin bone. And it's a very important bone. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about that bone later on. Of course, all these bones are connected together by ligaments. Ligaments connect bone to bone, and these are just a few of the ligaments that can be found in the horse's lower limb. Going back to the front, we can add in some more of the ligaments that are found there. And you'll see there, there's almost a bewildering number of them that hold everything in place, including some structures that are not yet visible in this little presentation. We're going to remove all of those for now and really just focus on the parts of the horse's lower limb that are so important when we're describing proper hoof care and shoeing. So we'll start out by adding this tendon down the front of the horse's leg. There are actually two that have been added, but you can't really see one of them. These are the common extensor and lateral extensor tendons. These tendons are responsible for allowing the horse to tip their hoof up. Down the back of the leg, we have two other tendons. The first one I've just added in is called the superficial digital flexor tendon. And you'll notice that it inserts or connects at the top of the short pastern bone, just below the pastern joint. You'll also notice now the function of those two proximal sesamoid bones up there at the back of the fetlock. Those bones serve to keep the superficial tendon centered and running true across the fetlock joint as that joint is flexed. And now I've added in the deep flexor tendon or deep digital flexor tendon. This tendon is responsible for allowing the hoof to tip backwards in the horse. And a little better view of that tendon, you can see how the superficial flexor tendon actually divides and the deep flexor tendon passes through that division, that split, and comes down to wrap around the navicular bone, that third sesamoid bone, 
and insert or connect into the bottom center of the coffin bone. Back to the front view here, and we're going to add in the scutum, this little sort of chitinous covering, much like an insect shell, over the navicular bone that helps provide a nice smooth surface for the deep flexor tendon to move over. Because the health of the navicular bone is so very important to the horse's long-term comfort and soundness, and yet its function is so poorly misunderstood by the average horse owner, I think it's worth spending a few minutes talking a bit more in depth about exactly what the navicular bone does. When we see a foot make contact with the ground, what exactly is happening inside the hoof capsule? especially with respect to the navicular bone, which I mentioned its health being very, very important to the long-term comfort and soundness of the horse. Well, the navicular bone functions not as a weight-bearing bone, but rather as a pulley to redirect the motion of the deep digital flexor tendon and maintain a constant angle of pull on the coffin bone. You'll notice that as the foot makes contact and the fetlock sinks, the navicular bone drops down, and as the fetlock joint rises, the navicular bone rises with it, rotates forward with it. By allowing the deep flexor tendon to cross over that, that pulley, it will maintain a constant angle of pull, of force, on the coffin bone, independent of the position of the fetlock and the pastern joints, which is very important. This large structure I've just added into the foot is known as the digital cushion, and this is a large fibrous fatty mass found at the back of the foot behind the coffin bone, and it helps absorb the forces of impact when the foot comes down to the ground and comes under load. On either side of it can be found two large vertical plates of cartilage. These are known as the lateral cartilages. Their function is not well understood, but we do know that if the foot is improperly balanced uh, over the long term, these cartilages will tend to ossify or turn to bone. It's not usually associated with lameness, but still it's a condition that we'd like to avoid when we can. And, of course, the foot is a very vascular part of the horse's body. There's a lot of blood to and from it. Uh, veins show up here in blue and the arteries in red, as well as the nerves I've added in in yellow. The growth chorea cover the coffin bone, and from the growth chorea comes the hoof wall, the sole, and the frog of the foot, the, the tissues that grow on a continual basis. And they emerge from this specialized tissue called the chorea. On the outside of the coffin bone, attached to that growth corium, are the so-called sensitive lamina. And a little closer view of the sensitive lamina will show that they look like if you took a drapery and shoved it together on the curtain rod so that it hung in folds, that's very much what the lamina look like. On the inside of the hoof wall are the corresponding uh, lamina called the insensitive lamina. And you can see in the microphotograph here, the insensitive lamina on the left interlocked with the sensitive lamina on the right, which are the ones that are coming from the coffin bone. And this is what holds the hoof capsule onto the bone. They're very, very strong, very, very difficult to rip apart. And you can see in the photo that someone has some forceps and is trying to tear it apart. And it's very, very difficult to do. And as I said, the hoof wall has these attachments on the inside of it that line up with or interlock with the uh, sensitive lamina on the growth chorea on the coffin bone. And that's really a good look, very basic look, but a good look at the anatomy of the horse's lower limb.
it's a very complex structure and we can't possibly talk about all of it but we've talked about the important functional aspects of the lower limb. So now that we've taken a look at the lower limb anatomy of the horse and given ourselves a, a point of departure for the rest of our discussion, let's take a look at how the hoof functions in the daily life of our horses. Obviously the primary role of the hoof is to facilitate efficient movement. After all, the horse is a prey animal and he needs to be able to get away from his predators very quickly. But also, the foot bears the weight of the animal and it dissipates energy from the impact of the hoof with the ground. The hoof actually expands as it comes under load and helps dissipate some of the vibration and shock of that contact with the ground, particularly at higher speeds. It has to do those roles while protecting the sensitive internal structures of the foot. After all, if the horse is lame as a result of either of these others, uh, the, the hoof is of, of little good to the horse. The foot plays a role in what's called proprioception, sensing the environment. Although the foot, uh, the, the hoof wall itself doesn't have nerve endings in it, the foot does have nerve endings up at the coronet and the vibration of ground contact and the environment is transmitted up the rigid wall to those nerve endings up higher in the foot. So the foot does play an important role in sensing the horse's environment. The foot plays a very important role in circulation through the foot and the lower limb of the horse. As the foot comes under load, the hoof wall expands outward, mostly back in the heel quarters region, and it creates a partial vacuum in the foot. Well, if you've ever been in a, a physics class, you've probably heard the phrase, nature abhors a vacuum, meaning that any time a space is left, something is always trying to fill that space. In this case, that something is blood. So as the foot comes into contact with the ground and comes under load, it expands, creating a partial vacuum, a bigger space in the foot, Blood rushes into the foot to fill that void. When the foot's lifted from the ground, it contracts again and squeezes the blood up and out of the foot. And that's the primary circulation mechanism for the horse's foot and lower extremities. So how do we know what, what constitutes normal for a horse's hoof? Well, one place to look is at a group of horses that are largely unaffected by human beings. These are the feral horses of the U.S. Great Basin region. Let's go take a look at them.
I always enjoy watching those feral horses move around on their native terrain. Dr. James Rooney, the well-known author of books on lameness and equine anatomy, as well as being an equine pathologist for many years at a number of universities, has this to say about the equine hoof form and where it comes from. The hoof of the horse has evolved over millions of years, giving a selective advantage to equids in the environment in which they lived. It is apparent that the hooves of all modern equids conform to a basic pattern, and we can assume that pattern is optimum or nearly so. There are variations of that basic pattern, however, and it is the basic premises of this analysis that those variations in different horses in different environments can be understood as a function of the forces exerted on the hoof and the surfaces upon which the animals are habitually moving and standing. So now that we know what the hoof does in the daily life of the horse, let's take a look at the factors that contribute to hoof form and quality. So for any particular foot, there are a number of factors that determine what that foot can look like and will look like and how good a material that foot will grow. That includes the genetics of the horse. Obviously, hoof form is tied to genetics. We don't expect to see a draft-sized foot on a little pony. So genetics does play a role in it, and we also see different things like different toe angles and different basic hoof shapes that are associated more with one particular breed than another. So yes, genetics does play a role in what the form of the hoof can and will look like. Diet is a very important part of how good a foot can be. If we don't feed the horse properly, he doesn't have the sufficient uh, vitamins and minerals, the building blocks to create good tissue, he's not going to grow a good foot. Stressors in the horse's environment are an often overlooked factor in not only the hoof quality, but in the overall health of the horse. Stress has adverse effects on all living organisms, and the horse is included in that. So things like um, a bad social life for the horse, where he's in an adversarial relationship with other horses all the time, or isolation, being kept in a stall 24-7 without seeing and interacting with other horses. Any sort of stressors can and will affect the f form and quality that that horse's foot can attain. Conformation is a much more important factor in the form and quality of the hoof. How the horse's limbs are put together, particularly up at the higher joints, are going to affect how that foot will look. Movement. Movement is very key as well. The more the horse moves, the more the foot is able to shape itself to the form it wants to be for a proper landing. And finally, the environment that the horse is moving over. So the most important of these three, in my opinion, in my experience, are conformation, movement, and environment. They are the real determining factors in the hoof form for any particular horse. You'll notice that nowhere in our list does it mention hoof care or hoof trimming. Obviously, feral horses achieve optimal hoof form without the intervention of human beings. Keep that in mind because it's very important. When we see everything coming together and working properly, the hoof exists in a state that I like to call dynamic equilibrium. I call it dynamic equilibrium for a couple of reasons. First of all, equilibrium suggests that everything is working properly, is in balance. And so it's reach, reached a state of, of status quo, if you will, of everything being nicely balanced and the hoof is in the form the best form that it can be in. But I use the word dynamic in front of it because it can change in a heartbeat. If a horse is subjected to a particular kind of stress or an injury, something like that, that hoof form can change very rapidly and uh, very adversely at times. So 
Uh, I call this dynamic equilibrium for that reason. How do we know when a horse, any particular horse, has reached this condition? Well, it's indicated by straight hoof capsule growth with no flare or thickening. That hoof wall is going to grow straight from the coronet to the ground. It's not going to have a thicker wall at the toe, and it's not going to flare out back in the heel quarters or anywhere else. There will be some degree of solar concavity present. It's hard to put a number on, no one can put a number on how much concavity a particular horse can attain, but every horse will have some amount of concavity there to the sole. There are no flat feet on horses. And insensitivity to terrain variations. The horse will be comfortable on basically any sort of terrain. Horses have not evolved to live in, uh, in uh, sawdust-filled stalls. They are comfortable and can be comfortable on any kind of terrain. Let's simplify things a bit by using the following graphic to illustrate how the feral horse achieves optimal hoof form and function. In the horses of the U.S. Great Basin, what we see is a great example of extreme movement over abrasive terrain. These horses are out moving on an average of just under 12 miles every day of their life over very abrasive and unforgiving terrain. Those abrasive forces, coupled with the movement at work on that foot, lead to an optimal hoof function and form for that particular horse. When the foot is in its optimal form and function, that leads to or causes proper bone and joint alignment, a proper landing, and straight hoof capsule growth, as we've talked about just a few moments ago. When we have proper bone and joint alignment, proper landing and straight growth, this facilitates the extreme movement over abrasive terrain, and on and on this cycle goes. So after all is said and done, what, what do the end results of all of this look like? Let's take a look. The characteristics of the ideal horse's hooves are they show a smooth, straight hoof capsule with straight horn tubules. There's no bending or waviness present in the horn tubules of the hoof capsule, those little lines that you see in the hoof capsule. Everything is growing nice and straight from the coronet to the ground. An arch will be present in the heel quarters of the hoof wall. Just as human beings have an arch to their foot, so do horses. The only reason we're used to seeing flat feet on our domestic horses without an arch in the hoof wall is because farriers are trained to trim feet to be flat in order to accept a horseshoe. But in reality, the horse's foot has an arch in it that's very important to proper expansion and contraction of that hoof as it's loaded and unloaded, respectively. They'll show a rounded outer edge on the hoof wall. This is worn onto the wall by this extreme movement over abrasive terrain, day in and day out. This has been come to be called the Mustang Roll. The sole will be smooth and concave, and the bars of the foot will be blended in with the sole. They won't stick out above the sole when viewed from the bottom. It's a nice smooth surface because it's been polished by the abrasive terrain. The frog will be flat and dry and will come into contact with the ground only when it's loaded. In other words, the frog won't stick out below the heels if you were viewing the foot from the top. It will only be in contact with the ground to act as a cushion when the foot comes under load. And lastly, there will be no acceleration of the coffin joint at landing. What does that mean? Well, it means that the foot must hit the ground, must come into contact with the ground flat, evenly, both left to right and front to back. So the result of all of this abrasion on the bottom of the horse's foot, traveling many miles a day, means that the horse's foot contacts the ground flat, 
with no rocking or motion from side to side or front to back. In other words, a landing that produces no acceleration of the coffin joint. This is extremely important to the long-term comfort and health of the horse, and it protects the internal structures of the foot. Notice the characteristics we've been talking about on this feral Mustang's foot. Note the characteristics I just described on this Mustang's foot. And you'll notice that this was a fairly small horse um, by the size of the hand in the picture. But notice the smooth wall with straight tubules. You'll see the very pronounced arch in the heel quarters there, the rounded outer edge, the smooth sole on the bottom and the bars blended in with it, along with that flat, dry frog. The average feral horse travels just under 12 miles every day of his life, whereas our domestic horse's travel is measured in feet or even in steps. That means that we need a substitute for all of the abrasion the feral horse experiences through trimming our horses. And we can substitute that into our U.S. Great Basin cycle of balance for abrasion and travel. So it's necessary to substitute proper trimming into the U.S. Great Basin Cycle of Balance, which will lead to optimal hoof function and form, which will create or lead to joint alignment, proper landings, and straight hoof capsule growth. And that substitution into the U.S. Great Basin Cycle of Balance is necessary because, simply put, our domestic horses don't travel as much as our feral horses do. Here are just a few examples of what proper trimming on domestic horses looks like. I've included these four horses only because I happen to have photos of them and could put them into this video. These four horses couldn't be more different. The first horse on the left is a Bureau of Land Management Mustang that was captured and is now in captivity. Uh, after his trim. The second horse is a Halflinger Gypsy Vanner Cross. The third horse is a Swedish Warm Blood. And the fourth horse is my Peruvian Paso. Very different breeds with typically very different looking feet, and yet you'll notice they all share the same characteristics with the feral Mustang's foot that we looked at earlier, the smooth wall, straight wall, the rounded edge, the arch in the heel quarters, the smooth sole, etc., etc. And here's what proper trimming looks like in motion. Notice as the hooves come into contact with the ground, there's absolutely no evidence of any vibration, shaking, anything at the instant of contact. The foot simply meets the ground smoothly and evenly. No side to side or front to back motion obvious in these horses landings. This is very important to the horses long-term comfort and soundness. In fact it's it's vital to their long-term comfort and soundness. Now that we've had a good look at what proper trimming looks like, it's time to examine the dark side of hoof care and see what the consequences of improper hoof care can be. Note that a hoof can be out of balance in one or both of two directions. So when it comes to talking about hoof imbalances, they can occur in both the medial lateral or side to side direction, medial be meaning towards the midline of the horse, and lateral meaning away from the midline or side, and the anterior posterior or front to back direction, anterior being front, posterior, posterior being the back. When you have a foot that's not properly balanced, a number of conditions uh, ranging from, you know, merely troubling in the short term to disastrous uh, can occur, including less than optimal movement. And this can be the result of either or uh, medial lateral 
or anterior posterior imbalance or both at the same time. Increased risk of injury from the same two causes there. When the foot is not properly balanced, the horse is much like, more likely to stumble or trip or interfere. Um, a properly trimmed foot that's the proper short length, uh, the horse does not ever have interference problems and they will be moving their best because we've removed obstacles to proper movement. Sheared heels is a little more serious. When a foot is left unbalanced medialaterally, uh, usually this is because the heels themselves have been left two very different lengths for a long period of time. The tissue at the back of the foot can actually tear in two and it's quite painful for the horse and, uh, and it takes a while to get them back on track. Side bone. Back in the little anatomy video I mentioned the lateral cartilages present at the back on either side of the coffin bone and I mentioned that those can actually ossify or turn to bone if uh, the horse is experiencing bad medial lateral balance over a long period of time. Ring bone is a much more serious condition when it comes to uh, lameness and it can be caused both by bad medial lateral and or bad anterior posterior balance. Ring bone is when there's a ring of bone, hence the name, that forms around either the pastern joint or the coffin joint and uh, it, it's a real problem for soundness for the horse and is not fixable. Quarter cracks can also appear. Cracks back in the heel quarters. If the foot is out of balance and landing improperly, those stresses and torsions on the hoof wall can actually cause the wall to crack. And probably the worst of the conditions is navicular syndrome, meaning what appears to be pain located in the heel region of the horse, but no solid uh, evidence to support that diagnosis of a navicular disease problem or true navicular disease which is when the deep flexor tendon and navicular bone where they come into contact with each other is damaged and uh, this comes from uh, an improper landing in the long term. The acceleration of the deep flexor tendon across the navicular bone, that friction will damage the tendon and the bone. Let's take a quick look at a few improperly balanced feet and how they contact the ground. Note that unless the foot is extremely unbalanced, our visual acuity simply isn't good enough to spot the imbalances in the ground contact. So let's slow things down a bit and really take a careful look. You'll notice that with each of these horses, because their heels are too long relative to their toes, that the heels contact the ground first and the foot slaps down. This what's called third order acceleration at the moment of contact with the ground is extremely damaging to the hoof in the long term because the deep flexor tendon is causing friction where it comes across the navicular bone and you can see the vibration in the leg particularly in the uh, fetlock joint when the hoof comes in contact with the ground because of that extremely long heel. As I say this is very damaging and any hoof care provider should understand that this is absolutely not how we want horses to make contact with the ground. It's not in their best interest. See the shaking in the feet? And this one is particularly disturbing with the amount of vibration and shaking you see in the leg as the horse comes into contact with the ground. Obviously the harder the terrain the worse this problem is. So after watching this you might wonder why anyone would ever deliberately unbalance feet. Well basically it comes down to a misguided attempt to straighten limbs.
which can't possibly work. If you take a look at how the bones articulate as the foot makes contact with the ground in this short animation, you'll quickly understand why it can't work. As the horse's hoof comes into contact with the ground and the joints are flexing, you'll notice here in just a second that their construction only allows for articulation in the front to back direction. They're not designed to flex or articulate side to side. So an unbalanced foot in the side to side direction leads to real joint problems because of torsions on the joint. So whether a horse is pigeon-toed, splay-footed, cow-hocked, any of those typical conformation faults that we see in a horse, that originates much higher up in the horse's body than down at the ground level, and therefore cannot be addressed down at the ground level. So as I just mentioned, the horse's lower joints are not designed to articulate in a side-to-side -side direction. Any turn to the limb occurs at these two joints, the hip or the shoulder. Everything below those two joints can only articulate in the front to back direction. And that's why unbalance uh, left to right, medial laterally, is so damaging to the horse's joints because they simply are not designed to articulate that way. And no amount of twisting down there can fix or straighten what has occurred higher up in the horse's body. I think a good analogy to help understand why deliberately unbalancing the bottom of a horse's foot can't possibly help straighten his limb can be found by comparing the situation to a set of wheels on an axle. Imagine a set of wheels, brand new wheels and brand new tires on those wheels on an axle that's properly adjusted so that the wheels are nice and parallel just like your car is or should be. If I were to give this assembly a push, it would roll true. It would roll straight, no problem. But what if I misadjusted the parallelness of the wheels and tried to roll this? It's not going to roll very easily, if at all, right? And it's going to exhibit a very strange wear pattern on it. So the question you have to ask yourself when you imagine a horse that's let's say that's splay footed, kind of like my, uh, my wheels on my axle are, what kind of tire can I put on this to make it roll straight? The obvious answer is no tire will allow this set of wheels on this axle to roll straight. Why? Because the problem isn't with the tires, the problem is higher up in the mechanism. The wheels themselves are not parallel. In the same way, when the farrier tells you that he can straighten your horse's limb by deliberately unbalancing the foot, they are misinforming you. It cannot be done for exactly the same reason that no tire will make these wheels roll straight. Let's try another scenario that's very common. Suppose I bought some, uh, some discount tires and they're not so good. In fact, when they came out of the mold, they had a big lump on them. Well, because the tires are softer than the road, um, eventually this bump will get worn off. But for quite a while, I'm going to have a very bumpy ride. And you can imagine the, the tire, as the wheel turns round and comes across that bump, it's going to li literally lift the whole wheel and then fall again as it goes over the bump. That's exactly what happens with your horse when he has a long toe or long heels, more commonly long heels. Um, he is literally fighting against the fluid movement that he should be experiencing because he's got extra material there that's standing in the way of proper movement. Now as I mentioned, if I've got this assembly right here and I'm out on a nice asphalt road, if I drive long enough those lumps are going to wear off. But what if I made the wheels out of titanium? Now I stand no chance of wearing the lumps off. I'm doomed to have a lumpy, bumpy, bad ride forever 
because there's no way to wear off the titanium wheels because they're much harder than the road surface. This is exactly what happens when a farrier puts a shoe on an unbalanced foot. That horse stands no chance of correcting his own foot through wear. He is doomed to be out of balance and fighting against the trim job, shoeing job, until the farrier comes again. I'm sure this has come as quite a shock to many horse owners because it quite literally flies in the face of so much of the information being passed on by veterinarians, farriers, and other horse owners. Nevertheless, it's all very logical and completely true. And what it comes down to is we have but one fundamental choice in hoof care. Although the forces that shape the hoof can, to some extent, be influenced, they can't be stopped. I like to use Niagara Falls as a comparison for this. Imagine at the top of Niagara Falls that I drop a big boulder down by helicopter right at the edge of the falls. Well, for a while, the water will divert around that rock. But the forces of friction from the water moving past the rock are a constant. They are constantly wearing away at that rock. And eventually, that rock will be gone and the water will flow again unimpeded. Hoof care is exactly the same way. We really only have two choices in hoof care. We can either help the horse get to that state I call dynamic equilibrium through proper trimming. It will allow him to move properly. Or we can stand in his way. Standing in the way is throwing up obstacles, resistance to proper movement, corrective shoeing, improperly balanced feet, long heels, any of these things that do not allow the horse to move in his best unimpeded way will be a problem. And so everything that's done in hoof care can come down to one of these two things because you know what? The way that horse wants to put his foot down is exactly the same every time. You are not going to change how he wants to put his foot down just because you put a special shoe on the bottom of his foot. It has nothing to do with it in the same way that the tires on the car, the lumpy tires, will not change what's happening with the axle. The axle is the axle and the tires are the tires. So hoof care really exists on a continuum. We can either hinder the horse, prevent him, slow him down from reaching dynamic equilibrium by doing these crazy things to his feet, or we can help him get there through proper trimming, balancing the foot so it comes into contact with the ground properly and the horse experiences the best possible movement he or she can and the longest usable life and soundness. We've spent quite a bit of time now talking about what proper hoof care isn't well, we haven't really talked much about what proper hoof care looks like. Well, it looks like the feral foot. That's what it looks like when it's done. One of the things that may not be obvious from the pictures, though, is that the feral foot is quite short. In fact, it turns out that nature trims the foot to a certain depth based on the tissue of the foot. And a good trimmer will trim the same way. Much as the surgeon doesn't walk into the operating room with a ruler and say the appendix has to lie six inches from the hip bone and I'm going to take out whatever I find at that spot, the good hoof care provider will go in and look at the tissue of the foot and trim strictly in accordance with what the tissue of the foot shows him or her to be correct. The fact is, hoof care can never be about creating proper movement. Hoof care can only be about allowing proper movement by identifying obstacles to movement and removing those barriers. Just as nature does with friction, when the horse is traveling miles and miles every day over abrasive terrain. 
the obstacles are removed from the foot, allowing every horse to move to the best of their ability. Nevertheless, we ought to spend a few minutes acknowledging some of the many reasons people believe that they trim or shoe a horse in a particular way. Let's talk about those. So when we look at the objectives or the alleged objectives of hoof care, and mostly this falls into the horseshoeing category, they usually fall into one of three general categories I've found. They're either described as being for protection, for correction, and or for enhancement. So let's take a, a very brief look at each of these and see whether we or not we now believe that shoeing or trimming can provide these things. There's no doubt that a shoe is a spacer and will raise the foot off the ground approximately a quarter of an inch. So it absolutely will prevent excessive wear because you've now covered a softer surface with a harder surface and that harder surface is what's now in contact with the ground. So if excessive wear is a genuine problem, yes, of course a shoe can fix that problem. Preventing bruising, though, is a very different issue. Horses bruise on their soles because their soles are usually not hard enough to withstand stepping on certain things, sharp stones in particular. So if this quarter inch of space that the shoe provides takes you safely over rocks, then yes, I guess you can claim that it would prevent bruising. However, you have to know that when you put a shoe on a horse, the quality of material of the sole actually diminishes. I've demonstrated this time and again to clients where I've taken their horse who's shod in the front and barefoot in the back and shown them the difference in the density and hardness of the front sole versus the back sole and, and it's, it's remarkable to see. So I'm sure you've all encountered horses where they've lost a shoe and they're sore but the barefoot horse in the pasture next to them is perfectly fine. That's because their sole simply is not of good quality at that point and is being bruised very easily. It's also no doubt that we can modify traction. We can either add or subtract traction from a horse's foot with a horseshoe. Um, subtracting traction is not normally intentionally done. The only case that I'm aware of is with the hind feet of a uh, reining horse with slider plates. But in fact, a, a plain horseshoe is actually slipperier than a bare foot. So you have to be careful about that because if you take your, your horse that's shod with fairly plain shoes out onto, say, wet grass or uh, icy surface, they're more likely to slip than if their feet are left bare. Most of the, mech, uh, most of the devices that we add to a horseshoe, uh, most of the different styles of horseshoes are all about different kinds of traction adding devices. Uh, heel cocks, toe grabs, um, rims, uh, fullering, which is putting the groove in the shoe. All of those things, different kinds of nail heads, all of those things are about traction, adding traction. So in the protection category, there are some things that we could do, but really they come down to preventing excessive wear if that's a genuine problem or modifying traction. The correction category we might as well forget. I hope I've shown you that we cannot straighten crooked limbs with horseshoes or with trimming the foot in a particular way. It simply cannot be done safely and effectively. You may get the horse to stand statically with his feet more parallel by twisting his leg around, but as soon as that foot leaves the ground, it's going the direction that it wanted to go before. and you're putting a lot of torsion in directions that the joints were never meant to articulate on that horse's lower limb. The provide support thing is always a fascinating one to me as an engineer because if you ask any engineer or physicist 
if you can add support by putting something on the bottom of something, they'll quickly tell you that you can't do that. The only way you can add support to something is to increase the surface area. And the shoe is actually in contact with less of the horse's foot than if the horse is standing directly on the ground. So in fact, a shoe lessens support. It does not ever add support to the foot. In the enhancement category, you cannot increase stride length with a shoe. That just isn't logical that the horse is going to take bigger steps by adding things to his feet. You can, however, increase the action of the horse's limb. If that's a desirable goal, adding weight of whatever kind to the, the, the end of the limb will, in fact, uh, usually it doesn't cause the horse to pick their foot up higher. What happens is the amount of weight that's added swings the leg up higher, and the peak in their movement occurs later in the swing phase rather than in about the middle of the phase where an unshod foot's peak occurs. And so it makes a horse appear to have be lifting his or her feet much higher. And if that's a desirable goal, you can achieve that by adding weight and length to a horse's foot. However, there is a cost involved. And the cost comes in the form of extra strain from accelerating and decelerating that mass, that added mass. When you add weight like that, it's got to be sped up and slowed down, and that does add to strain on the horse's limbs. So if you've been following along with me through this video, a pretty logical question at this point would be, why don't we see more lame horses? Why aren't we practically tripping over lame horses in every barn we go in if hoof imbalances are really so bad? Because hoof imbalances are very, very common. They're everywhere. The fact is, some horses will be very sensitive to how they're trimmed, whereas many horses will never take a bad step. But this is a short-term thing. There is absolutely no doubt that hoof imbalances cause joint damage. And therefore, for the long-term comfort and health of your horse, it's very important that your hoof care provider be leaving your horse with a well-balanced foot. One of the most difficult things about transitioning any horse to being barefoot is, in fact, finding the right person to do that job. And frankly, it's practically never the person who has been caring for your horse's feet. Why? Well, because the average farrier is not trained to trim in accordance with the principles that nature uses to trim those feral horses that we've been watching in this video. And unless they're trimmed that way for a proper landing, the horse will have problems eventually. Usually, the farrier is trained to over-trim the foot compared to what nature would do, and a typical scenario is then the farrier pulls off the shoes, he or she trims the foot how they would if they were going to shoe the horse, the horse is immediately lame and the shoes go right back on. So you need to do your research when it comes to finding the right kind of person to provide the right kind of care for your horse's feet. Transitioning can take a long time. After all, the damage probably didn't happen overnight. And so it may take a while, as, as much as a year or so, for the horse to heal up. In the meantime, assuming you want to ride, probably you uh, should look into some hoof boots for times when you want to ride over very rough terrain. Your horse won't need them for standing around in the pasture or standing around in a stall or even riding in a sand arena but some horses will need some additional protection while they're being ridden over rough or rocky surfaces. Also, it's important to remember that any hoof care provider only sees your horse a very short time in that horse's life. I estimated not too long ago that the average hoof care provider sees a horse only one-half of one-tenth of one percent of that horse's time. And that means that as we saw earlier, there are a whole lot of other factors that affect hoof form and function that your hoof care provider has literally no control over. Some of those factors include laminitis, which is 
a breakdown of the connective tissue between the hoof wall and the coffin bone. The lamina become inflamed and the weight of the horse literally starts ripping away at that connective tissue that's inflamed. It's a very painful condition. And as a consequence, it's a metabolic problem that's a consequence of improper feeding or some other stressor. And it can be both of those things at the same time where one alone may not be sufficient to cause the laminitis in concert. Uh, it can push the horse into a laminitic episode, which is very painful for the horse. Toe cracks. When uh, feet are too wet or get too long and aren't trimmed frequently enough, if that's combined with usually with a lot of movement over hard ground, uh, a crack can develop at the toe, which can be very difficult to get to grow out because debris gets jammed up in there and seems to damage the, uh, the lamina. So uh, routine trimming is a really important to helping to prevent toe cracks. White line disease is a bacterial infection of the white line, the uh, connective tissue between the sole and the extre extremity uh, of the hoof wall. And that is a bacterial infection that eats away at that connective tissue and then will move on up into the lamina and destroy it as well. And it can leave large parts of your horse's coffin bone unsupported. And um, most of these organisms seem to be anaerobic, meaning they thrive without oxygen. So it's important to try to keep any little separation you see at the white line clean and dry to help stave off any instance of white line disease. Abscessing is a, is a common occurrence in horses. It's more common probably in horses that uh, are in a laminitic episode or recovering from laminitis because of the stretched white line leaving little openings up into the hoof. But uh, it also happens anytime there's a, a serious enough bruise or especially a penetration of the sole by a sharp object, you'll have an abscess occur. Hoof and frog infections are also unfortunately very common. Uh, some of the more common ones would be things like um, thrush, which is a white, kind of a, a powdery looking infection of the sole, or frog, and it's a fungal infection, I think I just mentioned that, and can be treated with an antifungal agent. Uh, more serious, I think, and, and more common, I see a black bacterial infection in the central sulcus of the frog. This is a tarry looking, foul smelling black liquid stuff that um, can literally eat away the frog to the point that the horse is quite lame. And antibacterial agents seem to work quite well in treating this. And the worst infection probably that a horse can have in their foot would be canker, which is quite destructive to sometimes the frog, sometimes the sole, and it's also a very painful uh, infection for the horse. It, it has a lot of uh, blood supply to the, the, the tumors, the growths that erupt in a case of canker, and uh, clearly a nerve supply as well because it, it, these horses are quite painful to be even being touched. So not only do we need proper hoof care, but we need proper management practices in place to help keep potential problems uh, to a minimum with our horse's feet. And finally, keep the following in mind when it comes to caring for your horse's feet. The best hope any horse has for long-term comfort and soundness is to choose a horse whose conformation is well suited to his tasks. I often see people who buy a horse and then decide to do X, Y, or Z with the horse, and the horse simply is not built for the stresses of that particular kind of activity. And so it's important to choose a horse for the activity or 
choose an activity for your horse. There are good books and other references on confirmation and the kinds of things that make a horse suitable or unsuitable for particular activities. Try to, try to do that. Try not to put more stress than necessary on your horse simply because you want to do something with a horse that's entirely unsuited for that particular task. Manage the horse properly. Make sure you're feeding your horse properly. He's getting enough exercise and he's in as stress-free an environment as possible. It makes a big difference to the long-term comfort and soundness of your horse if he's being properly cared for. Find a professional hoof care provider who truly understands what you can and can't do by trimming and shoeing. I hope this video has given you some, some good insight into what you can and cannot do through trimming and shoeing, and you find a person who understands that and can give you the kind of hoof care that will ensure the best long-term comfort and soundness for your horse. It's also important, as I pointed out at the beginning of this video, to accept the fact that none of us know everything about everything. We all have limitations to our knowledge. We need to seek out confirmed, reliable sources for information. And they're not always who you think they might be. They might not be the most popular person that you find on the internet. So be very careful about that. It's very important. And finally, be patient. Things didn't happen to your horse overnight, probably. So when you're looking for the best for your horse, take your time and be patient with the path that you've chosen. And I'm sure if you've done your homework, things will be fine in the long term. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've gotten something out of it. It's important to me to share information, accurate information, with as many horse owners as possible, and I love talking about the equine hoof. So please stay tuned. I hope to do more of these videos in the future. Visit my website and have a good ride. Hi, I'm Steve Hebra. I certainly hope you've enjoyed this rather brief look at some of the theory and practice of proper equine hoof care. I've made this video in an effort to help educate as many as possible about the right and wrong of hoof care. And I hope you'll consider sharing this video with other horse owners so that they too may benefit from knowing what they should and shouldn't be seeing when a hoof care provider comes to work on their horse. If you really find the subject of hoof care interesting, as I do, please consider joining us for one of our Liberated Horsemanship Gateway Clinics. This is five days of intense trimming practice on cadaver hooves, coupled with lectures on the theory of trimming, on uh, other equine management factors like uh, f proper feeding of the equine, the equine digestive system, uh, supplements, uh, stressors in the equine environment. We cover quite a few different subjects. This is taught strictly by leading professionals in each of their fields. I know you'll enjoy this. Please consider joining us at the beginning of June for our next offering of the Liberated Horsemanship Gateway Clinic. Thanks a lot.